have a very important uh, keynote speaker today, but before we kick off with Patty, uh, I want to say a few words as to why we're even here. You know, there's lots and lots of music conferences. Why do we need one? Um, you know, don't we have South by Southwest, and there's all kinds of festivals, and you know, why the heck are we all here? Well, I've noticed that in some areas, women do really well on playlists. Country seem to be thriving, singer-songwriters, but we're having some problems in the rock arena, okay? We're having some problems getting airplay. And I think that it's important to have a forum where we can figure out what the problems are and how to solve them. So to bring together a really diverse group of women from different disciplines um, to talk about these things and from different areas, I think is really crucial because the only way that change is going to happen is if we can talk about it and create change in ourselves and awareness in others without blaming people. And that's one thing, you know, one thing I'd really like you guys to leave at the door before you walk in is like, well, it's the industry or well, it's, you know, whatever. Let's just like leave that behind and figure out what we can do to be proactive and take control of our lives and rather than laying blame on people and the, you know, it's guy's fault, it's whatever. I think we just need to figure out a way to create success for ourselves. Because you know, there's a big pie out there and we don't really have much of that. We've got a few little crumbs, but that's about it. So I think, you know, I want to see more women on playlists. I want to see more women on the rock playlist. Modern rock, you know, um, it just seems like we've got two flavors right now in uh, radio. We have vanilla and vanilla. <laughs> That's it, okay? And we're in such political times right now. There's all these songs waiting to be written about politics. We've got war, we've got, you know, we've got bird flu, we've got all kinds of things, you know? <laughs> all this inspiration here, you know, and we're kind of listening to, oh, baby, 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 you know? So how do we get this to happen? How do we create change around us and change inside? And how do we mentor other people? How do we bring people into our community? How do we create communities where we live? These are really important issues. You know, I, I would love these women from Sweden to go back to Sweden and go, okay, let's take these, you know, 16-year-old girls who want to play guitar and give them some lessons. We do. They, they, they absolutely do, and I know that they do. They absolutely do. See, they've already done it. We should be learning from them. Right? Um, so I've got, I've got kind of a mantra for the weekend. And uh, that mantra comes directly from our keynote speaker tonight, uh, this morning. And those words are, people have the power. OK? We do. We all have the power in this room to change what's around us and what's within us. It's really easy to be discouraged right now, to look around at the political situation, to look at the music industry, to look at how things are changing, look at the environment, um, the epidemics, looking at the news that's scaring us every two seconds with something new that's going to kill us, you know, some new germ warfare terrorist thing that's going to happen. And it's easy to look at that stuff and go, you know, what's up, you know? And to want to stay in your room and close the door and not get out there. But it's really important to take that energy and turn it into something positive. And that's what musicians do. We take things, we take questions, and we turn them into art. So we need to be able to get that out there. People have the power. This weekend, we're going to cover a lot of different topics. Uh, we're going to talk about songwriting. We're going to talk about racism in rock. We're going to talk about parenting. You know, how are you a mom? How can you be a mom and go on the road? How do you do that? How do you juggle those things? We're going to talk about the rock and roll personality. You know, like, what is the personality, you know, of people who want to play music? There are probably real similarities between all of us in this room versus the people who are in a room of accountants. And maybe we have some accountants in this room, too. That's entirely possible. Um, we're going to find out how we finance our career. And, you know, I want you guys to know that all these panels are not just like, this is how you do this, but they're discussions. You know, there is no, like, one agenda I've tried to really create panels where there are multiple points of view. And, um, and everybody's going to come away with something different, you know? And that's the whole point. It's like, 
wow, I really connected with this person over here, this person, you know, maybe not so much, but I respected what they had to say. And respect is a really important thing this weekend, too. So um, I, wanted, I also wanted to mention something about uh, a discussion I had with Kathy Valentine, who is here this weekend. She's going to be performing tonight at the Triple Door. And I said to her, you know, Kathy, you're the bass player in the Go-Go's. You know, you guys were on the charts. It was 1982. What happened? You know, there's the Donnas. How come there's only like one Donnas? And how come they're not really on the charts? But you know, how come like one group or one artist gets cited all the time as like, you know, we have Bonnie Raitt coming here tomorrow. Why is like she the only slide player? You know, why don't we have like 10? Why do people always go, well, girls don't play guitar. You know, we only know three of them. You know, like in 50 years, we can only find three of them. You know, why is that? I mean, we've got to increase these odds. And that's what we're doing here, it's just making things better. Um, and again, as I said, and as Patty said, people have the power. So um, I think there's enough, more than enough to go around. I don't think that the pie has to be so divided up, and I don't think we deserve the little crumbs that are left. I think everybody in this room deserves to be able to make a living at their art. Okay? So now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce somebody who I think has had enormous, enormous influence on uh, our culture. And I think our culture is much richer for the work that she's done, the writing that she's done, um, everything that she's brought to music. I think she's inspired countless people here, you know, of any gender. And uh, I would really like to introduce the great and wonderful and incredible Patti Smith. Thank you. Um, see, I'm bending down. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organization for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to speak to you today. Considering the content of many of my other speeches, I'm always surprised when I get another chance. <laughs> So um, I've long contemplated what we would be talking about today. And uh, this morning I woke up, I don't know, about 4 o'clock in the morning. And I started thinking about my mom. And what I thought about was when we were kids and my mom and dad had uh, a lot of financial woes with four, four children my dad was often on strike, and when he was on strike, he had to pick it. He couldn't get another job. My mom worked as a waitress. And when these times, which were difficult, came upon us, my mom didn't say, well, not enough food, for, not enough money for food. Nobody's sending us any money. Guess we don't eat. What my mom did was to get another job on top of the one she already had, and then take some ironing in on top of that. My mom found ways. She went deep inside of herself and extended herself physically and emotionally to take care of her responsibilities, but also in doing that, setting an example of conduct for myself and my siblings. I think about this a lot because often when I visit a conference such as this or um, various places, could be an in-store, could be a press conference, and people will say, Patty, how can I, you know, get someone to listen to my CD? I don't have enough money to make my CD. I can't, I don't have enough money to be an artist. I can't get the government to give me a grant. 
um, there's a lot of concern about how to finance one's work or one's vision. And when I say, well, why don't you get a job? Um, <laughs> which is what I did myself from 67 to probably about 74. Uh, that seems uh, to be looked upon as an insult. I think that artists and musicians, um, all creative people, despite their sensitivities and despite the fact that we need our artists and musicians more than ever have a responsibility to, uh, just as any other citizen, to uh, get the necessary uh, uh, funding or whatever they need for their work. We have to work hard. We have to be diligent. In the times we're living now, these, I mean, I've seen a lot of rough times in my life, and uh, I don't know how old many of you are. I might be the older than practically all of you. So I have seen a lot of stuff. I saw practically, I would think, the whole birth and evolution of rock and roll in my lifetime. And also I've seen a lot of ups and downs in our country. But I really believe we are in the hardest, most difficult, and I have to say even the dirtiest times I've ever seen. They're the most demoralizing and the most exploitive of our young people, uh, the most corrupt in our government, and also we are in a state of fear, paranoia, and disinterest, which is uh, fueled by all the governments and big businesses on our planet. How do we, as a people, combat this? I've thought a lot about this. I've worked a lot with Ralph Nader, who has pretty much all the answers of how to combat this. If he had the numbers and the people and the belief uh, in him uh, that is blindly given to somebody like George Bush, he could do great things for our country. But how, since we are in the grips of the present administration, what can we do to conduct ourselves? What can we do? I've thought about this a lot because, just like any of you, it's very easy to get demoralized. We marched, we gathered millions in Europe, hundreds of thousands in America against the strike on Iraq, and we were ineffectual. We were ineffectual in that we did not stop George Bush. But we were effectual in one way. For a brief window, we let each other know globally that we exist. We exist who are marginalized. We exist who are aware. We exist who have uh, within us moral authority. We have to work more to let each other know we exist. I think that's one of the reasons why you're having this conference. You know, to physically look at each other, you know, to, to get a sense of your numbers, get a sense of uh, how all of you have people back home. You all have uh, websites. You all have a community. So you can come here, talk about things, and go back and try to strengthen the numbers at home. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, might, I hope I don't ramble too much. I'm trying to stay on target. So if I do ramble, forgive me, I'm on Africa time. Uh, <laughs> been traveling. Uh, <clears throat> I heard the Dalai Lama speaking recently, and one of the beautiful things he said, it was very simple, was this. For the things that you can't control, sometimes, you have to let them sit at bay and work diligently on the ones you can. I think about this right now. Right now, while we're sitting here, people <clears throat> on the India-Pakistan border, women with children, families, 
orphans, people by the hundreds of thousands are freezing cold, they're starving, they're suffering with diarrhea, disease, they don't know what's going to happen to them tomorrow, the next day, the next few weeks. And that is their, that is what they wake up to. They don't wake up with, oh, am I going to get enough money, you know, to put out my broadside, or I don't, I can't, you know, mix my new CD because my credit card's been maxed, or they don't have those kind of problems. Their problems are, I have four children, two are dead, am I going to be able to save the other two? Those are the kind of things that our fellow man are dealing with. That is their daily life. It is not our daily life. If we can't, for various reasons, go out physically to help them, except in our prayers, what can we do as human beings? Well, I have learned that no matter how, we feel, how guilty we feel or uncomfortable or responsible or confused about this, we cannot roll over, we cannot get depressed, we cannot ignore it, but we cannot ignore our own house. And I think in order to extend ourselves into helping the world, the environment, our fellow man, what our job, and we can think of it's our job in 2006, is to work on the inner revolution, our inner house. And how can all of us do that? We can do that by checking, clocking our nutrition. What are we putting into our body? Are we putting in excessive amounts of salt, fat, sugars? Are we taking care of ourselves physically? Are we eating a balanced meal and therefore setting an example for our children or young people around us? It seems like such a simple thing, but it's one of the most important things that we can address. How are we taking care of ourselves? Are we taking care of our teeth? Are we flossing? Are we getting them cleaned once, a, once or twice a year? All this might sound really stupid and silly, but I can tell you, I'm 58 years old, and I've spent a lot of unnecessary time messing with, you know, trying to take care of teeth that I didn't take care of most of my life, and it's a real drag, and a financial drain, and a physical drain. We have to be strong, clean, and aware, because the world is very up, and the way that I look at it, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So we don't get scared, and we don't recoil, but we get like, you know, the girl in the Terminator. <laughs> And when I tell you this, these are words that I also am telling myself. It's time to get it together, get physically together, clean our house spiritually, you know, um, physically, nutritionally. You know, it doesn't mean we have to become fanatics or anything, just aware, simple things. And check out, you know, how are our kids doing? What are they eating? What are they putting in their bodies? You know, what, what is on their mind? What are they watching on TV? Are they developing the concept that they're going to live in a world that, you know, has no parents, has nice clothes, has all the technology they need, and no real job or anything? It just exists. Like, I often wonder, Where's the office in Friends? <laughs> but uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really, there is so much great things in the world, so much to explore beautiful literature, beautiful ideas, great movies, 
Uh, our land is beautiful. Traveling the architecture and art of man, the great churches and s temples and synagogues, philosophy, mathematics, and science, the, the laughter of children. There's, you know, an endless uh, creative ideas musically and intellectually. There is so much out there. Even though they canceled um, Millennium and X-Files, <laughs> and even though it seems like I heard a rumor they're going to cancel Carnival, yeah. even then, <laughs> there is still hope. There is still how can they do that? <laughs> I mean, I've devoted two years of my life to Carnival, have a real big crush on Ben, and how can they just take it away from us? I mean, these are the questions I want to know. I want answers now. But <laughs> Anyway, uh, In 1971, I think it was, yeah, it was like, actually, we, we saw the date, the exact date. We went to the music, uh, the Experience Center, and they have, you know, the, the board, um, the, you know, the music board, I don't know what it's called, you know, where you make your record on, that they had an electric lady that uh, Jimi Hendrix had uh, designed and installed and we were uh, fortunate enough to record horses on it. So uh, we went and had a pilgrimage yesterday to visit it. And uh, there, um, there was a little notation of how, you know, they had had a party for uh, um, this, the opening of the studio, and then Jimmy went to uh, England. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to that party and I went, went to Electric Lady, and I had never been to like a rock and roll party. So I was, uh, I was too afraid to go in. And so I was sitting on the steps, because Electric Lady, it's right on 8th Street in New York, and you walk in, you go down the stairs, and then you have to go down another level to the studio. So I was sitting on the stairs trying to get the nerve up to go in the party, and uh, Jimi <laughs> Hendrix came out. He was leaving the party, and he saw me sitting there, and he, you know, he said, well, you know, asking me why I was sitting there, and I was told him I was too shy to go in. He said, yeah, I, I know the feeling. And he sat there and talked to me, and he sat there and talked to me, and he told me his vision of uh, the studio. I asked him how he liked it, and he was really, really happy and excited, and his vision was he, he had some duties to perform in, in London, and then he was going to come back. He was going to go up to Woodstock with musicians that he had met from all over the world, who spoke different languages, who played instruments perhaps in different tunings, and um, instruments that he didn't even, hadn't even seen yet or understood. But they were all going to go up into Woodstock, and they were going to sit in a huge circle and play together for three months in a state of decophony. Is that the word? Decophonous? Decophony? Well, you know, all, all over the place. Sounds, perhaps, that weren't in harmony yet. And play, and play, and play, and play until they found a harmonious place. All of these diverse musicians all over the world and create a new language through music, a new way to communicate globally through music. It was such a beautiful vision. And as we know, he didn't make it. And so we weren't uh, privy to um, Jimmy seeing his dream fulfilled in his lifetime. Why did that happen? You know, it's not ours to judge, but it is a case in point that the artist does have something special. All people have something special, but an artist, the artist, has a specific calling that the people need. The people need, and the people are inspired by, uh, they are magnified by, and the artist 
the musician, the painter, the poet, must, must tend to his own house, must take care of himself, because he's given a gift, and that gift belongs not to the artist, but to the people. So all of us who feel this calling must be very diligent, must take care of ourselves, must not fall in to a romantic and romanticized lifestyle or idea of how the artist or poet or musician is supposed to act. How you're supposed to act is to magnify your work, to animate God and produce a work that inspires and informs and leads the people. Well, that's what I think anyway. <laughs> So, I was thinking, wonder where this is all going. <laughs> I don't know where it's all going. I keep thinking about my mom, you know. I mean, it's also, it's great, you know, it's important to um, consider, you know, the, the role of artists as activists and also as uh, having some spiritual content to uh, inspire us and lead us. But all people are beautiful. All people have God within them and animate God as they seem fit. My mother made the best hot sausage sandwiches <laughs> ever. She was she did the best laundry. She, when she washed sheets, it was like a religious experience. <laughs> she would wash the sheets, hang them out in the line, shake them out with the wooden clothespins, and stand there watching them, you know, uh, flow, you know, sort of flow and be blown in the sun. And she, every time she did that, she always told me, She'd look at laundry, she'd do her laundry, watch the sheets, and she'd feel it was a new day. It was a new day with new possibilities, a clean slate. So here we are. We're at a conference. We're together. We're going to exchange ideas and go back with a clean slate, with new resolve, new ideas, newly inspired, and hopefully we'll all be ready to set an example for our children, our friends, and our family. So uh, I hope you have a great conference, and uh, it was nice to talk to you. Um, they've asked me to answer questions, if you got any questions, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and uh, that you didn't throw any tomatoes or anything. <laughs> <laughs>
to let people know what I'm doing musically, and I want to help these other women figure out how to alternatively get their stuff out without giving into the, the creepiness of <laughs> self-promotion, you know what I mean? Well, I if you have anything to say well, I mean, marketing and self-promotion, the words are, you know, they are sort of creepy words, but if you just look at it as like, Sharon, you know, I mean, you make flyers, you like, I mean, you make, you, uh, it's communication. If you think of it as communication, it's, it's all good. Where the, I mean, it's important to communicate with, with each other and to let each other know we're here. Um, everyone uses communication. Muhammad, um, whether it was Gandhi or Martin Luther King or, you know, whether it's, you know, um, I mean, Picasso, we all uh, find ways to communicate that we're working. We want, you know, everyone wants to share their work and share their ideas with one another. It's really motivation. You know, if you're, if you're of good heart and you have good motivations, your motivation is pure, you don't have to worry about that stuff. You know, it's all a matter of, um, you know, what, you know, your, your, your goal is. There's, you know, there's, they have websites these days, and we have more technology than ever in the world, you know? We have more ways of telling each other what we're doing than any time in the world. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with using all the methods that we have. I mean, they say that, you know, uh, Poland got their freedom, sol solidarity through the fax machine. You know, we can use, you know, we have to remember various things, whether it's technology or our government. They serve the people. We don't serve technology and we don't serve our government. They serve us and we have to be master of them. And, you know, if we can use them to our advantage, use them. You know, it's, I, I mean, when we used to do stuff when I first did our first poetry readings with Lenny Kay, I'd like make, you know, hundreds of flyers and go on uh, museum steps and give them to people and go to parks. I mean, I didn't go to restaurants and bother them, but, you know, <laughs> I did like aggressively pursue, you know, communicating that we were doing something. And uh, I didn't ever think of it as marketing. I thought of it as you know, like handbills, like Thomas Paine or Benjamin Franklin. You make your handbill, <laughs> hear ye, hear ye, that's what we're doing, you know. <laughs> yes? Are you psyched about the show you're getting ready to do with YouTube? Uh, <laughs> oh, um, yes, we, we are opening U2 at Madison Square Garden, and uh, for a band like ours, we are a New York-based band, but... Uh, still sort of a fringe band, so um, it's to play Madison Square Garden is really, really exciting. And uh, it's the dream of any band that uh, works out in New York, and it's our first opportunity, and we're grateful uh, to you too to give us the opportunity. So yeah, I guess I'm excited about it, but you know, <laughs> there are, it's, it's, it's a job, you know, um, um, but I, uh, it was nice of them to give us a chance because they're the first band actually that's ever given us a chance. So, um, uh, I'm excited to play with you, honey. <laughs> well, I think it's mutual. I think I think it'll be fun. You know, it, it's uh, uh, Madison Square Garden is you know in some ways it's a hellhole, but it's a cool hellhole. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, um, two parts. <clears throat> First one is: Are there <laughs> are there artists that you uh, are intimidated by, and if so, how do you deal? With it? <laughs> well, uh, I met Jean Moreau uh, a, a couple weeks ago in Ghent, and um, I sort of acted like Chris Farley. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Miss Moreau, Miss Moreau, uh, remember when you you uh, clasp clasp your bracelet on in Lumiere? And she said, "Yes, Patty." And I said, and really, I said that was awesome. 
<laughs> but uh, I can't say I, 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 uh, I, I can't think of anybody else who would, who would, uh, you know, get me in a dither like that. But uh, I don't know. I, 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 I think uh, if I met somebody that I respected so much that I felt a little nervous meeting them, I'd probably just tell them that, you know. But, uh, you know, I think most, most people, if you don't bother them while they're eating, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're happy that, you know, people care about them. But um, I can't really think of anybody more than that. Yes. Yes. Me? Yeah. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you meditate or is your music your meditation or how do you handle that? Um, because I like to meditate, but I tend to overdo it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I sort of know that feeling. <laughs> well, I think meditation is a very special discipline. Uh, I haven't really found the um, ability to meditate in a disciplined uh, manner, but I have my own versions of it. I think all people that create have their own versions because we have to go, one has to go deep inside of themselves sometimes to find a certain lyric or to find the right words or the right uh, visual elements to express what one wants to express. So I, I think that, that most creative people do some form of deep contemplation that might be in the medita meditation arena, but I haven't um, I haven't found the uh, ability to meditate in a more disciplined way. I'm saving that for when I get old. <laughs> a way to avoid, you know, things like grandchildren and stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm Katie from uh, Gia's Fix in LA. We're an all-girl band. And we want to thank you so much for do, taking the time to do this. You're I welcome. wanted to know, um, in all your career, what are you most proud of? <clears throat> oh, I, well, geez, I don't know. I guess, well, I would say there's like really two things. One is that the people that I've worked with, uh, some of them, especially Lenny Kay, I've had such a long standing and um, mutually uh, uh, loyal relationship with Lenny and I will have our 35th anniversary working together um, on February 10th, 19, uh, 2006. So, um, <laughs> but I guess the other thing I'm proud of is, you know, I'm always proud when <coughs> People say, you know, the work that we've done resonated, has meant something to them, has helped them in an hour of need, or uh, inspired them to, especially when it inspires people to do their own work. Because that's really why Lenny and I started, was to perhaps be a catalyst of energy for other people. So when people say that the work means something to them, or like last night, um, getting my special award. I'm I'm proud of those things. They they uh, they, uh, they 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 do mean something to me because the process of an artist belongs to the artist, but the work once you put the work out, it belongs to the people, and they decide what they want to do with it or how it's going to affect them or what if they're going to accept it. Um, or be uh, informed by it. So when they give you a good response, um, and I don't, I don't mean like record sales necessarily, though that would be nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean actual human response. Um, it, it, it gives me a source of pride. Yes. 
Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, huge inspiration as a writer and poet. And uh, once, I'm from Milwaukee, so I got close to the East Coast once, and I rode a bus for like seven hours, went to New York to see you speak at the Guggenheim, and Gregory Corso was supposed to be there. Will you show up? And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was great. And uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about like, the role of the poet in these times and any body you can see out there who's really doing well, I, I can't really, you know, give any, you know, I, I don't, I don't think of things in terms of, uh, you know, the new individuals because I'm not really up on stuff like that. You know, I pretty much live in the past, so um, <laughs> I can only say that I. I truly have, I have faith, you know, I have faith in new generations. I know that they will, you know, there's always new people and new ideas. I think the role of the poet is a very uh, unique and sacred one because the poet uh, distills all of, um, you know, all of the emotion, ideas, spiritual ideas, sensual ideas, um, all the interior landscape into a very special language, encodes everything into a language that um, is not marketable, uh, cannot be compromised, and is often uh, ignored and marginalized. But, um, and the role of the poet might be the loneliest role of all the arts, and therefore perhaps the most sacred but, um, well, that's all I have to say about that. It's interesting because I, uh, yesterday was the uh, anniversary of the death of Arthur Rimbaud, who, of course, was one of our greatest poets. So um, the uh, era of the poet is about us. Yes. Yes. Um, as a child, you were a huge inspiration to me, doing leather Tuscadero from Happy Days. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> to say, I, I, I started my own uh, record company after that rock and roll, punk rock records. Um, and I do what I do because I don't have any choice. And I'm wondering, you as a musician, as an artist, as a poet, when you were writing and composing and playing, did you know what you were doing was special, or was it just <laughs> you had no choice? Well, I was a late bloomer, for one. You know, I mean, I didn't. Uh, horses came out. I think I was like 28 years old or something. And uh, when when I was a kid, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I I would have been going to uh, Louisa May Alcott's uh, conference. You know, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, these things, it's like talking about having callings, you know. We, we have certain drives and we do the things that we're uh, driven to do. Sometimes, you know, we, we're like Jonah. You know, sometimes I felt a lot like Jonah. I just want to be a normal person. I want to be able to look at a beautiful landscape and not want to transform it into a work of art. I want to be able to go to a party and not want to have to write a lyric about the party. I want uh, to be able to engage in life without, without having to transform it into a piece of work. But um, the artist sometimes is very dogged, and it's sort of, I always thought it was sort of a sacred cur curse. Or, um, so, you know, we do the work that, that, that we have to do. You know, we do, um, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, there's always a certain amount of sacrifice, just like having children. If one has the, you know, the desire and is motivated toward being a mother, it's probably the biggest sacrifice of all. But, you know, being an artist too, um, a musician, it, there, it's all sacrifice because you have hours and hours of practice. You have all the time that you spend uh, considering and wrestling with the demons of your work, and then the um, the tedium, and the labor, 
that comes with the work. That's what a lot of uh, people that want to, you know, they think they want to have rock bands or something or be um, rock and roll stars and uh, a rude awakening comes in that one sees the, it's labor intensive. You know, it's dragging heavy equipment, it's waiting around, it's like suffering through, you know, all kinds of humiliating circumstances, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, if one believes in what they're doing, it's just like if you want to be a great cook and you have to start, you know, you know, washing dishes and then you have to go up the ladder and go through all kinds of humiliating jobs. You have to be the guy that scrapes the, the, the crappy food off the plate when you know you could be creating beautiful food and one day you'll get your chance. You know, every, we all have our apprentice times. We all have the period of time where, you know, which can be very discouraging, but that's where we prove ourselves. We don't necessarily prove ourselves when we're at the stadium. We're proving ourselves in all the steps, all the, all the labor, and, uh, but all of that, those days, the camaraderie and all the suffering and uh, all the sacrifice, in the end, that's what you'll remember. Because once you go on the road or you get some success, one day becomes the next day, and one restaurant because the next, and the next hotel, and the next venue, and you start remembering, you know, remember when all five of us had to stay in the same room and we were stealing the toilet paper because we didn't have any at home, you know. So. <laughs> we had, when Lenny, uh, when Lenny and our, the, the late and beautiful Richard Soule, our piano player, and I first started, in fact, we came to California and, uh, uh, and played like in record stores and bookstores. We all stayed in the same room and we had like sort of a manager friend named Jane Friedman. And uh, she always came into the hotel with like a tote, an empty tote bag. I thought, what? <laughs> what is she carrying that for? But it was always full when we left. <laughs> day I said, Jane, what do you got there? And she said, Richard's toilet paper. And there would be like five rolls of toilet paper, industrial strength. And uh, so you do it. You have to in this world. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Any, any last questions? I, I don't think we should end with the toilet paper roll tale. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm Rachel Sanaka from Ventura County, and I, I, I know for myself I've had a lot of challenges with men wanting to take my guitar and, oh, get my guitar player. You know, and I learned to, to say, uh, where's your guitar? You know, and um, it took a long time to get respect uh, of my own music community, which I have gained, and I play with some of the best pickers in town. And um, But uh, it took a long time to learn how to deal with um, a lot of the men that, you know, figure, ah, oh, girl with guitar, you know, yeah, mind if I play, you know, and, and kind of deal with them and, and say, well, I, actually, I do mind. Where's your guitar? You, oh, you're a great player? Okay, well, where's your instrument? And well, I wonder what your, uh, you know, experience has been with that, you know. Well, I can tell you one thing. Nobody would dare touch my <laughs> guitar. <laughs> But, but um, I'll tell you a little story. Just to sh I will tell you a little story that is a true story and to show you that this is not a gender-based problem. My late husband, Fred Sonic Smith, was one of our <coughs> truly great guitar players. And he was a very dignified man. He never touched another musician's guitar without asking in a proper manner and uh, never wanted anyone to touch his guitar. The guitar that he played was a Moserite that he played in the MC5 days. And in around 1980, he was playing in a club in Detroit. And uh, 
his guitar was in the dressing room, and we were outside the dressing room. And we came in, and there was some hotshot uh, dealer type guy who had not only touched Fred's guitar, but had turned it, you know, face down and had lines of coke on the guitar. Fred, who um, <laughs> did not like making scenes, I could feel it was almost like being next to uh, uh, the white buffalo. The, the, in, the inhale that he took inside of his body to get himself ready for this moment, just <laughs> because he could have just killed the guy. But he just, uh, Like, just flicked it off. The guy was going, hey, man, what are you doing? That's like, you know, you know, and it's like on the floor, you know, trying to. Um... <laughs> and Fred picked him up by his collar and said, don't you ever, ever touch my guitar again, or you won't live to tell about it. <laughs> that guy left. And of course, no one ever, ever again touched Fred's guitar, including myself. <laughs> so I guess I can finish out by saying a lot of things that happen, we sometimes attribute uh, the way that we're treated to be gender-based. And the way I look at it, some people are just <laughs> And they're going to be disrespectful no matter what gender you are. And, uh, you know, I, I like what Carla said. I don't really put the blame on anybody. You just, one just has to conduct themselves in such a manner that commands respect. And uh, I think that one thing I've learned uh, in my life when I was younger, I had ideals, of course, which I still have. But sometimes I could be, for no particular reason, but for pure attitude, uh, irreverent and inconsiderate to others. I still am myself, and I don't want anybody messing with me, but I have learned it's, it's really important to consider as much as you can um, how your uh, conduct uh, affects another human being. So I think we have to learn to respect ourselves, take better care of ourselves, and in doing that, it will teach us innately, just as a habit, to respect others. So thank you for inviting me. It was great to talk to you.